Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Patty Walshaw. I am a associate professor at UCLA. Um, I work in the Department of Psychiatry, and I work very closely with our epilepsy team and epilepsy program there at UCLA. Um, I'm a neuropsychologist by trade. Can everybody hear me? I can use the microphone, but I'm a teacher too, so I project all the time, usually <laughs> talking too loud. Um, so uh, I come to talk to you guys today about neuropsych testing and epilepsy. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, first of all, I don't have any disclosures, so um, nothing I have here, I have no um, tie to any you know, drug companies or anything like that. I will talk a little bit about medication effects and things like that as well on cognition, um, but I have no ties to any drug companies or not selling anything. Um, so I want to talk about how neuropsych testing can be helpful in epilepsy, uh, how it helps us understand the relationship between um, what's going on in your brain, how that shows up in behavior and cognition, and then also how that relates to epilepsy and the epileptic focus in the brain. Talk about how other languages play a role in interpretation of neuropsych findings, and talk about psychiatric disorders that commonly co-occur in epilepsy. So. Uh, I have a picture of a brain. We're going to talk a little bit about what the different functions of the brain do um, in terms of cognition, because that really helps us understand what to kind of expect for people who have epilepsy if their epilepsy is causing um, dysfunction in a particular area of the brain. So first we'll talk about the motor cortex. So that's kind of a strip right here in the center of your brain that involves having you uh, being making you able to move in every which way and direction. You have one on each side of your brain, and the opposite side controls the opposite side of your body, right? So left, right, you know, right controls left, left controls right, right? Just post, you know, posterior to that is the parietal lobe, which has um, a, a lot of different functions to it. Right next, right behind the motor cortex is the sensory cortex, so that's where we have all our sensation, your ability to feel all the different parts of your body. The parietal lobe also does other things such as reading, speech, sequencing, your ability to be aware of your body in space. So, you know, the fact that I can touch my nose even though I can't see my nose, I'm just, my, my brain just knows where my nose is, you know? You don't have to look at each step as you go down. Your brain knows I have to stick my foot out this far and go down that far to get, make that step work. That's kind of what the parietal lobe does in a lot of ways. It does a lot of math ability, spatial organization, um, a, little bit, a little bit of attention. We'll talk about that a little bit more in, in detail, but that's the basics of the parietal lobe. It works in conjunction with your cerebellum, which is at the bottom at the base of your brain, which does a lot for balance, motor control, um, ability to kind of make all the coordinated movements work as well as balancing your body in space. The occipital lobe, very simple, has one function, vision. That's it. It's got, you've got a whole lobe dedicated to that. That's because vision is super important for humans. We need to be able to see. Um, you have two sides of it and four quadrants of it. So if you have damage to one particular part of that occipital lobe, you can have a part of your vision cut out. Um, sometimes that people have that. Or if you have one of the hemispheres of your brain removed, you can have an entire field of the vision cut out. Temporal lobe um, has, has a lot to do with language organization, particularly in the left hemisphere, um, naming your ability to understand what people are saying to you, things like that. With inside the temporal lobe is a, a structure called the hippocampus. This is pretty important, especially in adult epilepsy. This is oftentimes a focus of, of epilepsy. And it's primary, it has one function, and that's memory. Okay, So the hippocampus is responsible for getting information in, consolidating it, and being able to store it for later memory, right? Once memory is in there and information is in there, it's stored in a whole bunch of different places in your brain, but the primary way of getting it in is through the hippocampus. So people who have temporal lobe epilepsy will sometimes have memory difficulties. Um, there's also a little structure in front of the hippocampus called the amygdala that does a lot of emotion and emotion regulation. Um, it works with other parts of the brain, like the frontal lobe, to help regulate that emotion. So if you have epilepsy in those kinds of areas, you can have difficulties with emotion regulation or emotion control. And the frontal lobe, that's kind of the biggest lobes in the brain, right up front here. Um, responsible for things like speech, attention, concentration, 
executive function, you may have heard the term for. Um, I put personality in there. It's not really where somebody's personality is stored, but we know that personality is a funny thing because it's made of a, of a lot of different components of what makes you you. And if you have difficulties in the frontal lobe, sometimes you can have changes that can make you seem like you don't care as much or you kind of have blue, not a lot of affect, you know, you may be disinhibited, things like that, have less of a filter. So that's what I mean by kind of personality. Um, okay, so we look at cognitive effects of epilepsy and there's kind of four main reasons that we see cognitive change in people who have epilepsy. One is the epi epilepsy itself, right? So if you have, um, uh, you can have focal epilepsy, which may cause deficit in a particular area. You can have more global epilepsy, which would cause more global cognitive changes for somebody or disruption even beginning from the beginnings of development. Um, and I put here that, you know, general cognitive impairment is in, in general associated with earlier childhood or infancy onset of epilepsy. A greater number of like what we, we have called generalized tonic-clonic seizures or grand mal or whatever you want to call them. Um, how long you have um, an episode of status. Um, status epilepticus can also affect kind of globally how your brain is working. Um, things like that. Another reason for cognitive change can be surgery itself, right? If we have, if you take out a part of the brain, your brain is gonna function a little bit differently, right? Now your brain wants to do everything it used to do, right? Even if you have surgery, it, it wants to make it all work and make it happen. It just may be a little bit different. You know, if you took out the French horn section of a symphony orchestra, the symphony could still play, it would just sound a little bit different. It's gonna work a little bit differently, right? Medication is another reason that you can have cognitive change in epilepsy, right? We all know that people, when you take these medications to help your epilepsy, it does help the seizures, we hope. Um, but the, what it's doing to the brain is also helping to make it more calm, right? So your brain electrically does not have as many seizures, but that also affects cognition. It can kind of cause slowing down, processing speed can be lower problems with attention and memory and things like that, that can be the same thing that helps us to not have seizures can also cause those kinds of effects. And the other thing is psychological symptoms. So I'm gonna talk a little bit in a little bit about um, how those things can appear, um, how they're more common in epilepsy as well. And we all know that if you have things like depression, anxiety and things like that, some of the main symptoms that go along with that are difficulty concentrating and paying attention. Because again, if you have a lot of anxiety, your brain has, is doing a lot of other things to think about what you're anxious about rather than what you need to pay attention to, right? It's, you only have so much bandwidth, and if you're using it up, that's, that's going to cause difficulties with attention and things like that. By the way, I'm going to talk for a little bit, and then I'm going to have plenty of time for questions, so feel free. Um, so we have uh, neuropsych testing is done a couple different times. Um, you can have it done uh, if you're having surgery. Oftentimes it's part of the pre-surgical evaluation. So it's, it's, it's standard operating procedure for any kind of surgical intervention that you have uh, neuropsych testing prior to surgery so we know what's going on. We have a baseline of your cognitive function. We can also use that to help determine are the places, it's like one more piece of the puzzle, right? So if you have things like EEG, MRI, PET, these are all pieces that kind of say the epilepsy is coming from there. Neuropsych testing is also one of those pieces. So we can say, wow, they really have, this person really has a lot of memory disruption, and EEG is also pointing towards left temporal function, you know, of onset. The MRI is also pointing there, the PET's pointing there. That's also all helping us to make a decision to say, oh, this looks like the right spot, right? Um, and so um, it also can be helpful to determine if other in, more invasive procedures are needed, like a WADA test, um, interoperative mapping, something like that. And then also, lastly, to determine if there's cognitive risk to surgery. You know, part of what we're doing when we're, we're assessing for um, whether or not somebody should have surgery is what kind of um, disruption is, gonna, is that going to cause cognitively, right? Our worst fear is that we would do a surgery you would continue to have epilepsy and then we've caused some kind of cognitive change that's really not acceptable on a functional level, right? If, we, if, if it's something that it's not 
something that we would ever want to have somebody have no memory or something like that or no, not, not ability to speak or something like that, right? And so we're really trying to assess what is the risk to surgery, right? Is, are we going to cause some kind of damage that we don't want to that's even worse than having epilepsy, right? So this is all part of a risk-benefit ratio, and, and your doctor should be using you know, all this information to help give you the information so that you can make an informed choice about whether or not it's right for you or your, or your loved one. Neuropsych evaluations, um, and so then we also want to do them post-operatively to see what kind of change there's been. In general, we don't want to do it right after surgery. We know the brain is healing. It's going to do wonderful, miraculous things right after surgery to heal acutely. Usually we like to see people between 6 and 12 months after surgery because then we get a better idea of kind of like what's going on um, that we kind of need to adapt for in the future. Non-surgically, we do, you know, your neuropsych testing is often done in patients who are not having surgery, um, just to identify areas of cognitive impairment and, and kind of what may be causing that, but also um, what we can do to help that person. Do they need accommodations at work or at school if they're, if they're children? Um, you know, what kind of things can be helpful in their daily life to help them get around and, you know, um, function to the maximum level possible, which is wonderful. Okay, so in neuropsych testing, we have a lot of different domains that we test. These are just some of them. Um, we're looking at kind of all the areas, how all those different parts of your brain function, and we really want to make sure that we have a good idea of that. Um, and we're going to, we, kind of, we do a lot of different tests. It's a very, <laughs> it's a heavy day. If you've ever done neuropsych testing before, it's like a full day of testing. It's a lot. We understand that. We're not trying to torture people. Um, but it really, doing all those tests gives us a very nice, fine, detailed um, assessment of what's going on in the person's brain, right? So, for instance, it, we're looking for things like, if you have temporal lobe epilepsy, is it going to be something that's more cortical or on the surface of the brain, or is it more mesial, kind of that hippocampus that we're talking about? We can use our, the, our test to determine if the pattern of performance that we're seeing looks like it's more on the surface of the brain or in, more in the middle of the brain, right? Um, and it's important, with, especially with temporal lobe epilepsy, to know where language is in the brain. We want to take all of our findings in the context of understanding where is your language in the brain. Mo a lot of times, uh, functional MRI can help us to determine exactly where language is in the brain. Sometimes this is also done with Meg as well. Um, and it's important to know because most people have left hemisphere language. That's, you know, you don't, I'm not going to say one side of the brain does this and one side of the brain does that, but really it kind of does. <laughs> your left side of your brain really handles a lot of language. It does a lot of detail. It does a lot of understanding of um, the basics of language. So can you hear what I'm saying and understand it? Can you speak back to me? Can you follow along? That's really what the dominant hemisphere does. And in 95 to 99% of right-handed people, that's on the left side. In 85% of um, sorry, in right-handed people. In left-handed people, it's about 85%. Um, but still, that's quite a large number. So the majority of people have that on the left side. Um, people that don't will have right hemisphere language. They might have mixed dominance. So you might have a little bit on the left, a little bit on the right, that kind of thing. Patients who have epilepsy who have a higher chance of having kind of this mixed dominance for language, especially if you've had an early insult, you've developed epilepsy in childhood, you're bilingual, or if you have temporal lobe epilepsy, those are all things that may cause your brain to have a different organization than other people. So when we do fMRI, I'm not going to talk too much about that because this is about neuropsych, but when we do fMRI, what we do is we do, at UCLA at least, we do three, a bunch of different language tests. At UCLA we'll do three. So we do things like object naming. So you'll see a picture of a banana and we say, what is that? And you say, oh, it's a banana. You'll read a phrase, and it'll say, like, long yellow fruit, and you think, banana. And then you'll hear a phrase, and it'll say, long, long yellow fruit, and you'll think, banana, right? What we're looking for is where does blood go in the brain when you do these tasks, because that's a proxy measure for what's go where language is or where any particular function is in the brain. That's what functional MRI really is doing. It's done by thinking only. Nothing is done out loud. We actually just, we don't want you to speak. It's more helpful because you activate areas of the brain better when you don't speak. Um, and what we do at the end is we combine all these to create a map to show where language is in the brain. And this is an example of a map. And all the little orange bits are areas where language is in this person. 
And that's helpful. And you can see this is radiological space, so left is right and right is left here. So this is all the left hemisphere on this side of the, on this side of the brain. And you can see that basically all of the numbers are sitting on that side of the brain. So this is all on the left hemisphere. So then we can say in this person, this person is left hemisphere dominant for language. And you can see actually within the hemisphere where these different areas are as well. Right? So this can help us also when we have surgery to determine if they want to do surgery, is it going to be close to any one of these particular areas? And then we can help you know, maybe wake them up during surgery or do some extensive mapping at the bedside to see and make sure that we don't disrupt any of these areas. So when you have temporal lobe epilepsy, there are higher chances of having disruption to language. So oftentimes you'll see patients have difficulty finding words. Um, you know, they'll be talking and they'll say, oh, it's, um, uh, it's a phone, that's it, yeah, kind of thing. So that's a classic example of a word finding problem. Um, your anterior temporal lobe is really responsible for organization of language. So it really wants to kind of put all the semantics together to really make it happen. If you have more posterior onset or kind of in the back of the temporal lobe, you can have difficulties with kind of comprehension, um, sequencing of speech, so you'd say things like rhinocephalus instead of rhinoceros, for instance, reading, naming, so this is where kind of some of your major language areas are kind of in the back here of their temporal lobe. If your epilepsy is more in the middle of the brain, so in that mesial temporal in the hippocampus, this is where you're going to see difficulties with memory, and in particular, this is new information. So again, like I said, once information's in, it's stored, and it's stored in a lot of different places. This is new information, like what did your spouse say to you yesterday afternoon when they told you to remember that one thing for this afternoon? What are the things you're supposed to remember on the shopping list that you're going to? If you're at school, what did your teacher say yesterday? You know, what did your boss say yesterday at work? These are all things that are new information. Things like your childhood, things like, you know, your parents and what they look like, the, all that stuff, that's all stored already. You know, that's not new information. So this is where people will say, like, it feels like my memory is getting worse. And it's right. So it's not your memory. It's the memory for new information that's coming in. It's because the structure called the hippocampus is being disrupted. And what we know that is that people, humans really are very linguistic creatures. We like to talk to each other. We like to listen to each other. And we really like to remember what people say to us, right? And so we know that when patients have um, difficulty with verbal memory, that really is a big reduction in quality of life because they really have feel like they've lost out on a capability that everybody else has. You know, they're like, oh, remember we talked about that yesterday? And the person's like, oh, I just, I don't recall it, sorry. Um, so that's one area one function that we really try to avoid um, disrupting if we can, especially with surgery. We don't want to disrupt that because it's such a detriment to quality of life that if that's the case, we might say, you know what, they have a really good verbal memory still. We may not want to disrupt the left hippocampus with a surgery. Maybe we do a different surgery like an RNS or something like that, some kind of stimulating device that's not going to cause a deficit cognitively. When you have frontal lobe epilepsies, um, you have difficulties with things like attention, executive functions, it's kind of what I mentioned before. So things like working memory, planning things, organizing your life, shifting between different things, multitasking, these are all kind of what you call your frontal functions. If you have them in the dominant hemisphere, so in that language hemisphere, you'll have difficulties with fluent speech, so being able to get things out fluently um, or without with a good flow to them. Um, sometimes if you have difficulties in frontal functions, you know, if uh, everybody I'm sure has heard of ADHD, um, stimulant medications help with ADHD. And that's because specifically children who have ADHD have difficulties with the frontal lobes of their brains. There's kind of just not enough juice in them, right? You give them a stimulant and it actually juices up the frontal lobe because you think, why would you give a kid who's hyper a stimulant? That seems counterintuitive. But it actually is that the frontal lobe of your brain is the control center. And it, in ADHD, it's like the control center is kind of off. So if you put a stimulant on, it's like there's more control, right? Stop when you're supposed to stop. Listen when you're supposed to listen. Don't get up. So this is the same. Stimulants have effects on all people. You don't have to just have ADHD. Everybody pays attention better if you have a stimulant, right? 
But if you have frontal lobe epilepsy too, it can also help. Patients who have brain tumors in the frontal lobe, this can also help as well. So it's something to just discuss with your neurologist. Obviously, there's um, difficulties sometimes with stimulants, some stimulants lowering seizure threshold. So you really want to have a good discussion with your neurologist if that's a consideration. But it can be helpful for some people. Patients who have parietal lobe epilepsy, um, this is a little bit more rare, but it depends. The disruption to cognitive function depends on the hemisphere. So if you have disruption in the language hemisphere, which again, it's usually the left side, you'll have more dif difficulties in appreciation of detail, math calculation, it's kind of the you know reading, a lot of detail-oriented stuff. Now I told you that the left hemisphere is mostly for language in most people. But that doesn't mean the right hemisphere doesn't do anything for language. The right hemisphere actually does quite a bit for language. It's understanding things like prosody of voice. Am I asking a question? Or am I making a declarative statement? Am I, um, can I understand the entire concept of what I'm saying? Not just the detail and the specific words. The kind of entire concept is called the gestalt, right? So the right hemisphere in most people does the gestalt. It looks at like, can I understand the big concept, the big picture here, right? If you have difficulties in this part, part of your brain, you can have difficulties not on, only understanding kind of the big picture visually, but also the big picture verbally as well. So that's just something to think about. I put a picture here because it, we actually had a patient who had a right parietal resection, and um, they, after surgery, they put a plate of spaghetti in front of him, and he couldn't figure out what it was because to him it just looked like a bunch of lines. When we gave him something like a cheeseburger, it was like, oh, I can see that's like a whole thing that I know is like a thing, right? But the spaghetti, it was very confusing because, again, to see the whole picture, to see the gestalt, that's what the right hemisphere does, especially in that parietal region. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about um, psychiatric comorbidities, right? Um, and it's important to know that this is more frequent in patients who have epilepsy than it is in the general population. Um, and it's thought that there, there is some shared neurobiology, right? So there's only so many parts of your brain, right? The brain has billions of connections, right? But there are some central main areas of the brain that are involved. And the same areas that are involved in epilepsy are often involved in other things, like in depression, for instance, right? So this is like these are the areas that are disrupted in depression. They're also the areas that are disrupted if you have temporal lobe epilepsy or frontal epilepsy and things like that, okay? You don't have to memorize this, it's okay. So the point is that there's some shared neurobiology. Um, individuals with epilepsy have a higher incidence, as I was saying, and some studies showing up to 60% of patients with epilepsy have comorbid psychiatric conditions, right? Um, the chronicity of the epilepsy is the, um, most, the thing that's most often related to the psychiatric comorbidity, not necessarily the type or frequency of the seizures. So like how chronic this is as a syndrome for you. The most common comorbidities are, are depression and anxiety. Um, and in general, this is true for all of psychiatry, things tend to recur. If you tended to have ep depression before, you may have it later on. And that's if, regardless of if you have epilepsy as well, right? This is particularly important for op, op, you know, surgical intervention because oftentimes people will think, oh, if I can just get rid of these seizures, I won't have depression anymore. Right? But actually what we know is that that's not true and oftentimes people will have depression even after they have a surgery and it cures their epilepsy, right? This is just important to know too because it's something to just keep an eye out for the entire time in this, in this individual. You know, if, if it's you, you need to be aware, like I'm a person that may get depressed sometimes so I need to make sure that I have help when I need it, I'm seeing a psychiatrist or a, or a therapist and, then I, and I'm getting the help I need when I'm starting to feel low. Um, it's important to know that these things really reduce quality of life, right? Um, it's, it, the psychiatric comorbidities are more powerful predictors of quality of life than the epilepsy itself, right? If you feel bad, if you feel down low and anxious, that's worse than even having just epilepsy, right? So we're, what we talk about always is that mental wellness it benefits your seizures. I'm, I'm not going to say that being well cures epilepsy. It doesn't, right? It's being psychologically well. However, we do know that patients who are less stressed, sleep better, 
have better, you know, less anxiety, less depression, have less seizures. They go along, right? It's, there's not a separation between like mental and physical health. That's not, they all work together. It's one organ that you've got going on here, right? That affects how you feel mentally. It also affects whether or not you're having seizures too. It's the same thing. Um, just a little bit of information about depression itself higher in females than males. Um, it's the rates in epilepsy are 20 to 55 percent. It's higher, it's, it's a higher percentage in patients who have mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, it's also important to know that some epileptic, anti-epileptic medications can result in increases in irritability and low mood. Some people are nodding their heads, yes. <laughs> um, uh, particularly one that starts with a K. I'm not going to name names. <laughs> um, and again, it doesn't mean that you can't take these medications. It is important to be insightful and aware of how it's changing your behavior and mood, though. If it's really causing a lot of side effects, it's important to either talk to your doctor about potentially switching that medication. It doesn't cause that effect in everybody. It causes it in some people. Or figuring out what's the best balance so that you don't have significant depression or anything like that, but that you can kind of manage your epilepsy at the same time. Um, I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions. So um, it's a, I think it's really important to treat depression early. It's episodic and recurrent. This is true for anybody, again, regardless of if you have epilepsy or not. So recognizing symptoms early in an episode is important, right? Um, these are the symptoms of depression up here. So these are some things to kind of keep an eye out for. Um, so cognitive symptoms of depression can also mimic cognitive symptoms in epilepsy. People feel foggy, they just don't, can't remember things, they can't pay attention. It's important to recognize that that may not always just be the seizures, it could be that the person is feeling depressed as well. So it's really important to kind of get this stuff identified quickly and early so that we can kind of get a jump on it. Another uh, common symptom is anhedonia. So people who have depression don't always necessarily look sad they may not be the typical melancholic, depressed, that, oh, I can't get out of bed, that kind of thing. Sometimes people are functioning just fine. They're going around, they're going to their jobs. They're having more of this, like, ugh, just meh feeling, like it's just nothing's important, it's just nothing is enjoyable as much anymore. Um, they may be more irritable. Um, and it's important to recognize that that is a, a pretty prominent sign for depression, and it, it doesn't always just look like sad. So. If you know somebody that's feeling that way, that, that may be something that they might need some help with. I'm going to talk now about suicide. It is important to mention it. It is, has a high rate in epilepsy, patients who have epilepsy. Um, it's high even in post-operative. It's higher than the general population. It's important to, just talking about it doesn't make it happen. Um, it's important to, if you're having thoughts like this, to tell somebody, and, and if you n have a loved one who's having thoughts like this, to make it a normalized conversation, like, it's okay, people feel like this, let's get some help about it. Um, you know, there are plenty of crisis lines and things like that. You should always, you know, talk to whatever health provider you have, um, you know, it's important. Um, mainly, we just want to keep you safe, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so let's see. For depression, there's plenty of different types of treatment, different types of therapy that are effective. Um, it's, therapy itself is not magic, it takes a little bit of time. <laughs> and so um, same thing with uh, medications that are helpful for this. There's certain epileptic medications, anti-epileptic medications that are helpful for depression and mood stabilization, things like lamotrigine. Um, and, but it's important to know that other things like SSRIs and stuff like that can be prescribed with these anti-epileptic drugs often and that they will be helpful. They may also take a long time to take effect too. So it's important to kind of just have somebody that, you know, can ha have somebody to talk to during that time. An SSRI like, you know, Prozac or something like that can take four to six weeks to really get into your system and have good effect. So. Um, Anxiety has, also has a shared biology with epilepsy. Um, same circuitry is involved as thing, things like temporal lobe epilepsy. Unlike depression, it's more equal between females and males. Again, that's kind of a generalized um, statement, but that's um, 
there's a higher incidence of anxiety in males than in the general population for patients who have epilepsy. Um, there are different types of anxiety disorders. So there's generalized anxiety, which is just um, excessive worry, essentially. Um, panic disorder, which is panic attacks and fear of panic attacks occurring again. Social anxiety disorder, OCD, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, kind of just general avoidance. You could be at risk for agoraphobia. It's important to talk to people about your anxiety levels. I have a lot of patients who have anxiety that's related to their epilepsy. You know, they start to feel like if I go certain places, I might have a seizure, so I don't want to go those places. And very slowly, their world gets smaller and smaller, and they start, you know, stop doing things that they used to do. That also leads to more depression, right? So, you know, we want to make sure that you can get out, do things safely, um, but also be out and doing things. You know, um, we don't want epilepsy to, to make your world so small that you can't do anything anymore, right? That's important to get out. There's plenty of different types of treatment. Cognitive behavioral therapy is the first line treatment for, um, for anxiety. Um, there's obviously different types of um, medications as well. Okay, so those are, so we talked about how um, different types of psychological things can have effects on cognition, but there also we talk about how different types of anti-epileptic medications can affect cognition as well. So um, some have, again, I, I have no alliance to any drug companies, so I just wanted to kind of put this, this is kind of what I've experienced in my um, world with patients who have epilepsy. Some have less cognitive side effects than others, it seems to be. The kind of two most uh, largest offenders, which actually have the most research behind them as being the largest offenders, are topiramate and zanisamide, which cause significant difficulty with memory, um, attention, working memory, how quickly your brain can uh, think through things. Um, same things with like phenytoin, things like that. It's really, like I said, it's really most important to discuss with your doctor the, the, how the benefits are outweighing the risks. The, so the risks being the cognitive side effects. If, if the cognitive side effects are so bad that you don't want to take the medication and you stop taking or stop you know, missing doses, that's not good either, and it's better to take a different medication, you know, because some of these things can be pretty, um, cause pretty significant dysfunction in your life, and we want to make sure that whatever it is, is, is helping you, but also not causing that much um, impairment. So what about weed? <laughs> We're in California, right? Um, it's important to know that there are not as many studies on marijuana because the federal government went through a period of time where it did not want to fund anything <laughs> related to marijuana, so we don't know as much about it. But of the things that we know, um, what we do know is that for, for specifically THG, the THC component of marijuana, that causes um, the most amount of effect on cognition, so particularly memory, attention, uh, processing speed, how quickly you can think through things. Um, that's because THC binds to certain receptors in your hippocampus, that structure that's involved in making new memories, and that's what disrupts it. There's even evidence that if you're a chronic user, that you can continue to have cognitive effects even after you stop using, right? So the general rule of thumb is that we want to have, especially if we're going to do neuropsych testing, we'll ask people to be off of their marijuana intake prior to that, six to eight weeks prior to that, because it takes that long for it, the cognitive effects of it to kind of wear off. Um, and again, it has nothing to do with whether or not we care about you smoking marijuana. It's more about when we do a neuropsych testing, especially like pre-surgically, we really want to see your brain off of everything that we can get it off at its purest form so we know are the effects we're seeing, are they a result of the epilepsy themselves? We don't want it muddied up with the other things like marijuana, like, oh, this is just how your brain looks on marijuana, so we, don't, we can't tell if the memory impairment is related to the epilepsy or related to the marijuana at that point. So that's why we ask people to stop, usually. Now, marijuana itself has two different components, um, THC and CBD. So CBD has a little bit more of a mixed kind of um, evidence to it. There, are, there is some evidence that CBD has a better effect than THC does on the brain in terms of cognition. THC is the component that will make you feel better, kind of more high. 
CBD actually has an anxiolytic effect, right? So it has, it has an anti-anxiety effect um, in people. It's binding with other different things in your brain and almost in a reverse direction. So when they do functional MRI studies, when they do all kinds of different studies, what they see is they almost have opposite effects of each other. So THC, while it makes you feel high, serves to increase your anxiety and depression over time. CBD has the opposite effect of that. So when you take them together, it kind of like balances each other out. But um, this is something that, you know, so they have had some limited studies on Epidiolex because that's a regulated medication um, that, that indicate no change in cognition um, over time. Um, it's hard to know all of these things because marijuana, as I said, is not well funded in terms of being understanding how it's functioning. And the limited studies there are are usually on kind of more regulated versions of things, not just marijuana you can buy at a shop or something like that. So, so that's, that's, that's what we've got so far on this. Um, last but not least, I just wanted to mention about language in terms of neuropsych testing. It's important. It's important to be taste tested in your native language. If you're bilingual, you should be tested in both languages. This is essential to all testing because what happens if somebody is bilingual and they're tested in the language that they're less fluent in? So say they're bilingual, but their English is not as fluent as their first language. What will happen is they will look lower on verbal testing scores, and but they're not really um, they don't really have deficits in verbal function. They just are not tested in a way that is act allowing them to access the um, um, their best of their abilities because they're not tested in a language they know as well as the per people that all of our other tests are normed off of, right? So it's important that you have your primary language tested as well as your secondary language um, and really advocate for the use of that um, in testing. Um, we can you make use of interpretive services if needed, if a neuropsychologist that speaks that language is not available. Um, and if you ha are bilingual, it can be very, very helpful in a lot of situations in your brain. People who are, being bi who are bilingual have better executive skills. They can shift between things much better because, again, you're shifting between different languages all the time. But that means you may also have more difficulty pulling words when you want to, um, things like that. So that's what I have today so far. But I'm happy to take any and all questions related to neuropsych testing. If you have them. Yeah? Do you see THC is like a neurotoxin? Like, is that like. So the question is is THC a neurotoxin? Right. So toxin has a, a bad semantic, right? right. <laughs> so all drugs are toxic to your brain, right? Even the AEDs you're taking for epilepsy, right? Drugs have, all drugs, I like to, I, one, somebody told me, all drugs have effects. How they're marketed is what they have as an effect versus a side effect, right? So the effect of THC is that you're going to feel better and high, kind of a little bit silly. Um, it may make you forget some things, which for some people that's great, right, in that moment. However, if you wanting to be using your memory function and things like that, that's not good in that moment. Really, so it's like, what's the effect? It's these kinds of things, and the side effect would be poor memory, poor attention, things like that, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Mm -hmm. I do. <laughs> Always, yeah. So if I have patients who are on those two medications specifically, I work with the neurologist to see if that patient can get off of that for just a washout period, usually about two or three weeks. And if they can, then I can get a better idea. And then they can go right back on the medication once they're done. So same thing with marijuana. If, if you, you know, I, you can smoke on the way out of my office if you want to, but as long as you don't smoke for six weeks ahead of time, then I get a better, clearer picture of your brain is the idea. Yeah. Now, um, for testing, most of my doctors have not recommended that or haven't even brought it up. Is that something that should be brought up more? Is it just a question for you is why is it not, why isn't it brought up? Which part? Uh, neuropsych testing. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends. <clears throat> it's, it's definitely brought up if you're going to have surgery. But if you're not going to have surgery, usually people will want to have some kind of cognitive testing done if they are having difficulty in their daily life. So difficulty at work, difficulty just 
remembering things at home or getting things organized like I got to pick up my kid and I, I forgot to do this over here you know then you may want to have an idea of like what's wrong because neuropsychic testing can tell us what's wrong and then we can think about how to go about getting around that you know what are kind of the accommodations you could get or is there things that you would need to help you like I got to write stuff down now or I need to have a list on the wall or whatever it is and that's you know I used to be able to keep it all up here, but it doesn't, you know, work that way anymore, kind of thing. So. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, in neuropsych testing, are you always given an IQ? Like, is that part of the neuropsych testing, or no? Not necessarily. We have tests that are part of the intellectual quotient battery, right? Um, I don't generally give. I do mostly pre-surgical testing um, when I see patients who have epilepsy, but in general, IQ is only helpful to me to see, relative to everything else, how things should be, right? So if your IQ is here and your memory is here, I can see, well, relative to your ability, you should be higher, right? So that I don't really care what your IQ is. I care in a relativity kind of way. That's what's helpful to me. The IQ tests... IQ is not really, it's an average of a whole bunch of stuff together. It's a, so your IQ is made up of verbal abilities, perceptual abilities, working memory abilities, and kind of reasoning, fluid reasoning abilities. And the main one score is the average of all those four scores. So the problem is, is if one of them are very low and the three, rest of the three are fine, the total score is going to look lower than it really kind of is. It just means that you just have one area that's kind of lower than everything else. But your other may, areas might be stellar, and so the full score is not going to give, it's not going to give you that detailed kind of thing. Sorry, just to follow up. Yeah. So you got some neuropsych testing done for a study. Mm -hmm. was, I have a daughter, she has Dervais syndrome. Okay. Um, I've never thought about getting neuropsych testing. It was done through the study, but mm -hmm. now I know the results. Yeah. So now... The, the, the box has been unlocked. So now I'm like, do I go get her retested mm -hmm. um, for the simple fact of just getting it done outside of a study? Yeah. I guess during the study, you know, it's done differently than it would be in a typical. Oh, yeah, a bit. Not right? To some degree. Some of the same tests are used the way you may not have had somebody who interpreted them in the same way. They just would usually in a study give you scores yeah. instead of like, here's, here's the full picture of what I think is going on. That's something you'd recommend to a parent or somebody. I, especially with kids, I usually recommend neuropsych testing because the you know, especially with kids who are in school and they're trying to learn and things like that, you're trying to teach them new things. It's really helpful to know where their strengths are, where their difficulties are, because then you can play to their strengths, right? right? And get as much information as you can in, because that's what children their whole occupation is learning, right? <laughs> That's until you're 18, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to just learn information, right? And so we want to get as much of that in as we can to just, you know, whatever skills we can get in, we want to do it at, at a good pace early on. So, Thank you. yeah, no problem. Any other questions? No, I've taught you everything about neuropsych testing. <laughs> that's wonderful. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm here. If anybody has questions, I'll sit, hang out for a little bit. You're welcome to come up and uh, happy to answer anything. Thank you so much. Thank you. No problem. <laughs>